was never talkative, so I really never knew knew him as a person. And my mother, she would talk, but then it never kind of seemed to say, sink into me. And I guess she didn't do a good enough job. Well, who were you closer to, your mother or your father? Closer to my mother than my father. Who, which one were you closer to? I think I was closer to my mother. Yeah. That, that usually happens, happens. yeah. Yes. Were you close to your parents? I was closer to my mother. You were? Mm -hmm. You know who my mother was? You. I was your mother. Yes. You mean your mother liked me and decided I should be something? <laughs> you are my mother. How can I really be your mother? You then? are. I don't know how I don't be. know. Something went wrong. Indeed, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we did something peculiar, I, to say the least. Well, I, I think something went right. That's how it, it well, worked that's out. that's how it yeah. reversed. Uh -huh. All along the way, there were certain milestones. There was certain, you know, there was the, the first time that she said to me, how exactly are we related? Or the first time she asked me if I had any siblings or if I had ever been to New York where I was born or if I had ever met Banish, my father. Um, there was the first time she asked if we had gone to elementary school together. And little by little, you know, you adjust what shocks you. No, that's all right. I don't have the hearing aid in. No. Whoop. Yeah, that's where little, you get your little, a little, what do you call them, nuts? Little nuts, yes, a little yes, tangle. Yes, thank you. When my mother was about 70, she began to have what everyone called problems with her memory. But it was, it was a type of thing, you know, that I have, <laughs> for whatever that's worth. But it's the type of thing a lot of people have. She got kind of repetitive. And then she got more repetitive. And while my father was alive, he very much was a buffer. He kind of covered for her. And I guess the first indication that this was maybe a little more than just uh, getting a little forgetful, was when my father died. And she managed to call and tell me that he had died. I flew home. I flew back to New York. When I got there, she didn't know where the body was. She had no idea what had happened to the body. And in fact, then over the next few days, she had no idea that he had died. And she kept, say, asking where he was which was disconcerting to have to keep saying, well, uh, he, he died yesterday. Things have not been easy for him lately either. How's that? I, I'm not sure if he's healthy or not. And, uh, no, I think it's health, and uh, it could not like it could be a short um, life. Well, you know, Banish died about five years ago. Yeah, and nobody told us. Wasn't that it? No, we knew. You were there when it happened. Oh, and he was—he's been gone, of course, since then. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I realized it, and it was in the muddled stage for each of us. You know, we each had a, a, a relationship with Benish. And then he was gone and he was a different person. Not a, we knew he died and uh, it just never came back again. It couldn't. Right. Yeah. So it wasn't easy and uh, 
you don't just change people, they're gone. Even though she could be profoundly confused on some levels, at the same time she could function amazingly well. And what she wanted at that point was to move back to California, which is where she grew up. And that began my role as the overseer of her life. Debbie? Yes? You're here. She's taking a picture of both of us. Just now we're going to get it. Oh, no. So look at Francis. OK, I got it. I should have a key. Everything is missing. Once she noticed she had a problem with her memory, she would compensate. She would make, write everything down. She would have notes to remind herself of things. And I think the first time that notes really became a problem and no longer just a useful aid was what I later started to call the dentist period. And the dentist period actually began because she had something wrong with a tooth of hers. And she began to write notes to herself because she was afraid that she was going to miss the appointment. And the notes piled up and became a complete and utter obsession. And while this was the topic, you know, while the tooth was the topic, it was the only topic. I mean, it was the only thing that was talked about for weeks on end. But eventually she made the appointment, her tooth was taken care of, and yet rather than that ending this period, in fact, everything escalated. And she began going to the dentist for no reason whatsoever every day. So every morning I would call her and I would plead with her over the phone. I would say, you don't have to go to the dentist today. You don't have to do anything today. Don't go anywhere, stay home. And I would just be pleading and she would seemed to understand, and she would say, oh, you're right, I don't, I don't have, okay, I don't have an appointment today, I'll stay home. And I would hang up and I would be so proud of myself and so grateful and think, aha, I've done it. And literally half an hour later, the dentist would call and tell me that she was there. And then her hearing aid broke. This was still at a point where I hadn't understood that notes were the enemy. And so I bought into it. I wrote her notes. But she copied my note over. So then we had a pile of hearing aid notes. And along with all the hearing aid notes, somehow my phone number started to appear. Uh, <clears throat> Debbie, this is your mother, and I wondered what the latest was on the hearing aid situation. Let me know when you have time. Thanks. Monday, 10.30 a.m. Uh, Debbie, I'm your mother, and I think that the, what do you call it, the hearing aid has, has improved. Do you know? Monday, 10.35 a.m. Uh, I'm Doris Hoffman, Debbie Hoffman's mother, and I want to get some information on hearing aid batteries. Thank you. 
Monday, 10, 46 a.m. I'm Debbie, your daughter, and I wanted to know about the hearing aid. Are you there? Monday, 11, 02 a.m. Debbie, you were talking to me, but I wanted to find out if there's any news about the hearing aids. Did you follow or did you hang up? Bye-bye. Monday, 11.30 a.m. If I was home and I picked up the phone and I tried to explain, um, your hearing aid's being repaired, Go find the note that I left you. Well, there couldn't be anything more disastrous than that to say on so many levels, because first of all, that meant she left the phone. So there I am on the phone, and I've just sent her off into her apartment. She, she's not going to remember what she's looking for. I'm there screaming into this empty phone, no, no, come back, come back. <laughs> Hello, Debbie. I've been waiting outside of my apartment. I hope everything's going well. And call me back. I'll be outside my apartment. Thank you. There was the Lorna Doone period, where she kept boxes of Lorna Doones hidden throughout her apartment. There was a podiatrist period, very similar to the dentist period. There was the ticket period, where if she had a ticket stub to a show she'd already seen, she would take that ticket stub and repeatedly try to see the show again. There was a social security period where she became convinced every month that she hadn't received her check and she wrote elaborate letters all over the country to try and get her check. There was a banana period where she would eat dozens upon dozens of bananas having no recollection she'd just eaten one. Her life was out of control. My life was out of control. It, it was really getting harder and harder for me to have my life. M more and more, my days were just spent trying to contain the situation. I mean, f first of all, I was so hysterical about the notes that I would arrive at her apartment armed with whiteout, and I would go to her calendar and whiteout anything she had written. And you know, after a while, you have to wonder who's crazy, her or me. I was, I was always so busy with the minutia of um, you don't have to go to the dentist today or your check came yesterday that I managed to never really step back and, and look at the big picture and think, well, what is really wrong with her? And finally, we did take her to have a medical evaluation, and I sort of sauntered in and said, well, I know that she's had a series of small, small strokes, because that's the diagnosis I want, that's the one she's had. They sort of humored me and said, well, we'll, we'll, we'll just decide what she has. And um, they said, no, she has not had strokes. She's not a stroke candidate. She's not someone who will probably ever have strokes, and she has Alzheimer's. Getting the diagnosis was an incredible blow. By this time, Alzheimer's was a sort of popular disease. I had heard a lot about it, and I had heard the grimmest and most depressing 
things of people, I don't know, lying in fetal position and just unable to talk and feed themselves. And of course, she was nothing like that. But suddenly it dawned on me, I guess that's where we're headed. I think so. Hello? Hi, it's Debbie. Hi, Debbie. How are you? Fine. How are you? Fine. And I don't know why we don't get together more often, but we don't seem to. Well, we got together last night. Oh, heavens. What did I do last night? Last night we all had dinner together. Oh, yes. Oh, I'm in, I'm in disgrace. <laughs> oh, that'd be awful if we all failed the course. <laughs> did they give grades now in school, in college? Well, we're not in college, so we don't have to worry about it. Oh, we don't do anything then anymore. You don't get uh, uh, college grades. No, we don't have to do that anymore. Oh, what do you do? Do you do just passing or what? Well, we're not in college, so we don't have to worry about any oh, grades. So it's, it's whatever the university decides that we'll talk about. Uh-huh. I guess. I don't know what else they do. My mother went to the University of California. She got a graduate degree from Columbia School of Social Work. And I think, you know, I think you could say that my mother was an intellectual snob who, even when she lived in California, she would not read the Chronicle because it was beneath her. Only the New York Times was good enough to read. And I arrived at her house one day in the afternoon, and she had, the TV was on, and it was the uh, Ed McMahon variety show with a, um, a child in a gold lame outfit tap dancing. Now, this is not my image of my mother. And she was not only watching this, but she was gleefully, euphorically watching this and laughing. And, and I was very upset. This, this is not my mother. This is beneath her. The time seems to run a little differently. Um, how old were we when we sort of got into uh, life, not life, but uh, at the uh, medium-sized medium age? Well, I guess I'm in medium-sized age, because I'm 45. You're 45. That's medium. Yeah, and I must be uh, near 50 then. Older than that. Is it really? 50-something then. 60? You know how old you are? 84. I'm 84? I never thought of that, Debbie. I haven't thought of my age in years. Oh, that's good. There's no reason to think about it. No. The first to go were the immediate memories, the really short-term memory. But she could remember a couple of years ago, maybe. And then that started to go, and essentially, the part of your life that you remember is further and further and further and back. I don't think I know many people left from, uh, where did we start with? Well, you started in San Francisco. Yeah, I guess I did. And then you went to New York for a long time. Who was I? Was I with somebody and in New York? You met Banish, and you lived with Banish for almost fifty years. You mean working with Banish, or what? Yeah, you worked with him and lived with him. I didn't realize that. Little by little, the only really, only real remaining memories are childhood and very early adulthood. And she remembers her parents fairly well. But what I always thought of as her life, what I knew to be her life, which was me and my brother and my father and the 50 plus years that she lived in New York, that's kind of mostly disappeared. Or that's just become a little puff that has occasionally some, some 
you know, something, some substance to it. Mostly it's kind of a blur, which was a little hard for me to take. But of course, I would always know you because I've known you since you were little. You knew me when I was born. Were you really? Because I was across the street or something. Where were you born? What street? 169th Street in Flushing. Oh, well, that's where all of us lived. Right. 169th Street, yeah. So I know, I knew you, I knew Francis. <laughs> I knew, um, oh, wait a minute. Well, Wait a minute. Well, what did I do in, in between then? She seemed to be at times, at periods, so suffering herself from the confusion and from the feeling stupid and from the feeling shamed and incompetent. Debbie, darling, I am your stupid mother. I've got everything mixed up. I didn't do anything I was wanted to do or did or didn't do. and. We didn't have a, a lovely outing and all sorts of things because I can't remember from one minute to the next what I do and don't do. I really loved my mother when I was growing up. I felt very, very loved by her, but with the Alzheimer's, there were times that she was uh, very hostile. And at times she was very hostile to me. Sometimes in particular to me because I was the person there the most. I was the person kind of trying to keep the lid on her, trying to keep order, which was so frustrating and aggravating to her that she would really turn on me and sort of see me as the enemy, which was... You know, really painful. For the longest time, I still insisted on truth, reality being important. So she would say it was April when it was May, and I would say, oh no, it's May. And finally it dawned on me, you know, I have to be out of my mind. I mean, what does it matter? First of all, so she'll say, oh, it's May. In the next minute, she won't remember that it's May anyhow. And secondly, what does it matter if she thinks it's April? If she was really convinced that we were in the sorority together at UC, or we were in elementary school together, at a certain point, I realized, why not? Why not say, well, actually, no, I haven't seen any of the AE5 girls lately, as opposed to saying, well, no, no, I didn't go to UC when you did because I'm your daughter and you're that much older than me. And so, it was a liberating moment when I could just say, no, I haven't seen anybody from AE5, have you? And it was kind of light and fun. And then, and then the, we were in the moment, and the moment was we were two old friends trying to reminisce and the content didn't matter it was the feeling you're going to be here and francis uh -huh. and me uh -huh. who else that's it that's it and we're all going to be here mm -hmm. and uh, so it should be lovely good i don't know what it is <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't either. <laughs> Here, you take a picture of Debbie and me together. <laughs> there you go. Okay, you just hold it and point it at us. All right. Do you see us? Yes, I see Debbie and see Francis. <laughs> oh, it says something I can't read. Francis, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, nobody can ever say you didn't take the picture. Yes. What does it say? For many years before she was ill and I was gay, this was something that was upsetting to her. And she worked on this and she became more tolerant and but she was it was never something she I would call comfortable with but once she started to have this disease she was down to basics and the basics were I had a friend Francis this person was very nice to me this person made me happy that was a good thing this person was very nice to her made her happy. That was a good thing. It was just very simple. Oh. When I found Frances here, she, she's being very careful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, she is. She's being careful. Nevertheless, we all love her dearly. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh -huh. You know it, and I know it, and Frances knows it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> My mother has always been a very independent, strong-willed, kind of a loner type. In my mind, her independence was more important than protecting her all the time. More and more things that could lead to catastrophe were happening. Hi, it's Debbie. Hi, Debbie. How are you? Well, I'm fine. I understand you got locked out. I got what? You got locked out of your apartment. No, I didn't. <laughs> yes, you did. Somebody just called to tell me that. Well, they may have. I've been here all the time. Well, no, you haven't. But you have to be sure you stay there. You can't go out wandering. You stay... But I was there in the building. Well, you were out of the, the apartment and you got yourself locked out. Well, I didn't. No one else did. <laughs> I don't know what you mean. Well, you just have to be sure you stay home. Well, I do stay home. Everyone was staying home. Yeah. There was er everybody who was who uh, ha had an apartment. They said, "Let's all stay at home," and we all stayed at home. Okay. Well, that's good. You just stay there. Yeah. It was it was the thing to stay at home. All right. Now you stay home for the night. <laughs> all right. I'll stay home for the night. Okay. Good. Okay. I don't like. To sleeping alone anyhow, and so I'm very happy to be in my bed by myself. You put your pajamas on. Yes, of course. And uh, all is well. I was constantly looking for a way to connect and a way to know what she's thinking and what she's feeling and what I should be doing. But it was kind of like interpreting dreams. If ever there was a period that seemed to have meaning, that seemed to be saying something to me, it was the suitcase period. And the suitcase period began with her taking out all of her suitcases and packing them. And it was not clear from how she packed them where she planned on going. I mean, they were packed with 
kind of anything and everything. I mean, she would just pack until there was no more room to pack anything. So I had to remove everything that might be construed as a container and still, you know, that she would find ways to pack. But, you know, I thought, well, she she's, must be, she's saying something to me. She's saying she wants to go somewhere. She wants to move. She doesn't feel at home. This is a, this is a period with meaning. Pack up all my cares and woes. Here I go singing low Bye So is he I began looking at places to move her. And I probably went to 30 places. It was vile. It was, you know, there would be, if it, places that accepted people with Alzheimer's mixed in with other people, basically the Alzheimer's people were drugged, put in wheelchairs and tied in. But eventually I stumbled into a place that was exclusively for Alzheimer's and that seemed to allow people to have their dementia, however they were going to have it. And the moment I walked in, I knew this was the place. When I um, talked with the director about how to move her, and I was planning, you know, well, how am I gonna tell her this? And she said to me, tell her nothing just horrified me. I thought, what? I'm going to just, you know, kidnap my mother, throw her in a car and bring her to a strange place and leave her there? She just said, trust me, do not try to explain this to her. You will just agitate the two of you so terribly you will not be able to discuss it. The night before we moved her, I go off to dinner with my mother and she said to me, you know, and she pointed at the apartment, she said, you know, I used to live when I was in college, I think, I had, I had a room up in that apartment. Um, well, sometimes I'd go and eat dinner there, and sometimes I'd even I'd sleep over, they'd let me sleep over, but I don't think I'll sleep there after tonight. I felt like, and believe me, we hadn't said a word. We had tried not to act any different. I felt that she knew and that she was saying to me, it's OK. You're doing the right thing. That's Esther. <laughs> this is Vivian. Hi, Vivian. This is Dora. Yes. And Ann is taking a nap. We won't wait. <laughs> and she was uh, a little cautious walking in. This is Doris. That's all right. Don't worry about it. Nothing's too important to come say hello to you. They immediately sort of took her a little bit away from me. I mean, it was, I guess the hardest thing I've ever done was walking out of there. 
I mean, I don't know if I thought I was going to feel some instant relief or something, but I didn't. I felt like I had just done the most horrible thing to a person I could possibly do. And we, Francis and I, drove home, and and uh, I just laid down. I, I just felt horrible. first time that they that, that we went back to see my mother and it was two days later and we were so frightened of what we were going to find and she was actually taking a little nap when we arrived so she woke up in this state saying all these things and she periodically I wrote it down afterwards because it was so shocking I was I, she would periodically just kind of throw her arms out and say oh the joy of me and then she would just look around again and... Uh, oh, good. It took longer for me to adjust to my mother being in a home than her. She was used to it instantaneously. Just as her watching Ed McMahon on TV was a bit of a blow to my image of her. And so the first time, you know, that I came and she was wearing some man's T-shirt and sweatpants, it was hard for me. You know, I had to keep making these adjustments, but I eventually caught up to her. M31, we have it, we have it. N31. There. What's the matter? Exactly 31. No, it's just the number. And if you get a whole line, then you win. I don't think I'll get it. Well, you got it last time. B13. You won last time. I've forgotten that. Mm hmm. B9. I have it. Okay. When we first moved her into the, the home, we brought some prized possessions that we thought were important to have her orient herself or a reminder of something. And she didn't want those things. Those things were a source of stress. It turned out, you know, that her apartment just represented added anxiety. Even though there was nothing she had to do in her apartment, it was filled with her life which she couldn't remember. So, you know, she knew that something would be familiar, but what exactly was it? And that would all set off anxiety. And she, you know, removing all of that was such a relief for her. Bingo! Yes, bingo. <laughs> you got bingo, would you say? Look, you got a whole lot of them. And she was finally, you know, down to just clothes that were not her own. Not a single possession except her pocketbook. She still clung to her pocketbook. But the only thing in the pocketbook it usually is some Kleenex and a penny. There's not another thing of her past that she has. they'd rather not have. Everybody who's there is going to get worse. Everybody's essentially going to die from what they have there. You know, and there's nothing uplifting about that.
But with, once you accept the parameters, my mother has Alzheimer's. And it is true, she is going to remember less and less and less, and she may very rarely know who I am. But if you can accept that, it can still be a very joyful life. It's so, uh, on one sense, so corny, and it's so profoundly, obviously true, that with the love, my mother's okay, and she's in a place where she is given constant, unconditional love, and um, she thrives on it. And by thriving, she's, she's happy. She is the ultimate of living in the moment. That's, you know, so she's sort of the ultimate enlightened person in that Well, I don't know, you know, what, what memory... I mean, I'm very attached to my memory. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm very attached to my childhood memory and my... It sort of does tell me who I am. But I guess it's clear to me that you can still be somebody without it. You, 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 you still have definition without a past. I did have a, a warm feeling for what the few of us made, made a sentence here or a sentence there go. Mm -hmm. And I, just now, just recent, just within the last hour or so, I began to think we were all parties together. Mm -hmm. That simply hit me today, uh -huh. just now. And uh, I'm happy it's here. And. Uh, I'm not sure I remember where everyone lived and so forth, but uh, there's something close that's still with me, and I'm grateful for it.